Well, good, good evening to our friends in Istanbul and all the others. A good morning on this side of the pond and especially very early morning to Erkin who's in California. It's 7.30 a.m. Uh, in his time. So thank you for coming. Um, so I, it's, it's our pleasure uh, to, to restart or resume this seminar series, Applications of Engineering in Medicine and Biology series, uh, curated as a partnership with, with Massachusetts General Hospital and Sabanji University. And we're, uh, we've, we've put together a, an excellent uh, series of speakers and we're happy to uh, welcome our first speaker, Dr. Akin Shenar. Erkin Shekhar, I'm sorry, uh, from University of California, Davis. Uh, he's, he's a friend, a close friend, uh, and an excellent scientist, uh, and we're looking forward to his talk. Uh, and formally, his biography is, is pretty long, and currently, Erkin is an associate professor and graduate program chair of electrical and computer engineering at the University of California, Davis. And he's also a faculty member in biomedical engineering, material science, chemical engineering, and biophysics graduate groups. So he, he joined this department in 2011, uh, and he received his PhD in the ele from electrical engineering and computer engineering department. Uh, oh no, electrical engineering from the U University of Virginia in 2007. Uh, and then he joined as a postdoctoral fellow um, to, to the Department of Chemistry at the same university. Uh, later on, he came uh, to Boston and joined our group uh, at Center for Engineering and Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Health Hospital, where he developed multiple electrode arrays for neural electrophysiology applications. Uh, and spearheaded the development of microsystems for monitoring transcriptional and se secretory dynamics at the cellular level. Um, at UC Davis, he's leading an interdisciplinary multifunctional nanoporous metals research group. Uh, and he'll be talking more about his research there. Uh, he's, been, he's been lucky and, you know, uh, to have received uh, many, many awards over the years including a uh, Fund for Medical Discovery Award from MGH, NSF Career Award, and NIH, N NIH NIBAB Trailblazer Award, uh, BMES uh, Cellular and Molecular Bioengineering Young Investigator Award, and a UC Davis Graduate Students Distinguished Graduate and Postdoctoral Mentorship Award. Um, so he's as I said, he's a, he's a dear friend and an excellent scientist, and we're looking forward to hearing more about his research. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen and let you share your screen, Akin. Uh, yeah. And please, please bring your questions, write your questions in the Q&A box, and uh, we'll address them at the end of the talk. Take well, away. thank you very much, Bashak, for the kind, uh, kind introduction. It's great to see you. And actually, Bashak had introduced me as well when I was interviewing uh, at Boston in, I think it was 2009, a super rainy day. So it's kind of nice circling back. Uh, and thanks for putting this seminar series together. And thanks to the Sabanj University for inviting me as well. I'm uh, really excited to connect with my friends and colleagues uh, over the seas and look forward to meeting you in person sometime soon as well. I hope everybody's staying healthy and safe and maybe dinner time for some of you. So feel free to grab something to eat meanwhile. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about my research uh, that I've been uh, doing since I started UC Davis. Uh, I titled it Nanopore Skull from an ancient material to biomedical devices. And this will become kind of evident why I uh, called it called it so. Um, just to give you uh, a quick summary of my group's uh, research thrusts, I started my life more as a microfabrication material scientist, uh, and that's still my bread and butter. But since I started UC Davis, we've been applying the material science to and microfabrication technology to building electrochemical uh, nucleic acid sensors, neural interfaces for recording and drug delivery, and recently combining these technologies into tissue chips. 
but the overarching theme uh, is really applying nanotechnology and microfabrication for microelectronics and life sciences. And there's excellent research going on in these areas in Savanji as well. So I hope uh, I look for forward to talking and connecting more about these topics. Today I'll give uh, I'll mainly talk about nucleic acid sensors and neural interfaces with some sprinkled material science in it, and uh, then conclude the talk with tissue chips. So let's start with the material that uh, have been uh, kind of dear to my heart uh, because I started my PhD working on this material um, and this is nanoporous gold. Uh, the, you can see the scanning electron microscope images here. The way you uh, build this material is you start with a gold silver alloy, which is, which is also known as white gold in jewelry. You leach the silver out and gold atoms diffuse at the surface electrolyte interface and self arranging the, this bicontinuous uh, open pore structures. This is a thin film deposited by the sputtering technology where we basically sputter silver and gold at the same time and the yellow in nitric acid. And uh, there are some key features with this material that is of importance. One of them is that it's a microfabrication compatible. So it's a nanomaterial and you can easily use photoautography and pattern transfer techniques to integrate it into the devices, which makes it uh, very easy to uh, basically translate it into functional devices. You can control the morphology. So this, what you are seeing on the top is a top view of the uh, thin film with NACM. Uh, it almost looks like you are actually increasing the magnification, but the magnification is the same. What you are changing is you are basically heating the material, uh, which uh, enhances the surface diffusion of gold atoms and basically the material coarsens while preserving a self-similar morphology. This is really important for structure proper to relationship studies in biology, mechanics, or material science. You can easily functionize the surfaces with a gold thiol chemistry, attached biomolecules, and it's electrically conductive. So it's useful for building electrodes out of these. Um, it's a promising material for biomedical applications uh, uh, for some of these reasons. All right, so a brief history about uh, the material. It's nothing but new. It actually dates back to pre-Columbian times where ending goldsmiths used this technique called depletion gilding. And the material was uh, basically a gold copper alloy called tumbaga, which is found in many of the artifacts from that area. It has uh, robust mechanical properties, but it did not have the gold finish. Uh, so the ending goldsmiths basically leached the copper from the surface uh, and uh, compacted it to make uh, a gold finish over it. At that time, as you may appreciate, um, access to scanning electron microscopes was pretty limited, so they were not able to witness this uh, nice morphology that we see uh, these days. There have been quite a few studies in understanding how the morphology evolve, evolves, uh, like Arlova group and Strat's group uh, looked, uh, developed computational and theoretical models, uh, during my PhD, with, among with others, I studied mechanical properties of porous metals. Uh, there have been studies uh, due to its high effective surface area to make uh, sensors or catal catalysts out of them. And there have been also studies on optical properties of these materials. So when I started at UC Davis, this material's uh, biomedical potential and microsystem integration was underexplored. I decided that that could be a good niche area that I can venture into. So now let's start with the first uh, of the research trust that I have. This is the neural interfaces. Uh, to motivate the talk, I can emphasize, and all, all of, uh, probably all of you would uh, agree, that uh, neurological disorders uh, have a tremendous impact on the society, and there is a big need and initiatives for understanding and deciphering the brain function to uh, develop some of these technologies and treat these disorders. While there have been pharmaceutical and surgical uh, developments, uh, and these still have their place, recently uh, the introduction of um, materials and also devices have made great strengths in uh, helping understand the brain and also uh, treating some of these uh, disorders. So let's take the example of uh, epilepsy, for example. It's a, a sporadic disease where a patient may have seizure. In order to uh, combat this disease, you need devices to continuously monitor the electrical activity. So let's say you have a device that is inserted into the brain that can record the electrical activity. And let's say while uh, if you detect a rogue electric uh, activity, you can release drug molecules to suppress uh, that activity so it doesn't turn into a seizure. But while you are doing that, you want to develop these devices that 
uh, basically bought well with the tissue, so they do not cause an adverse tissue response. And finally, if you are if these are fully implantable, then you won't need to have the communication and power uh, connection with them, uh, ideally in a wireless manner. There have been tremendous work in this area, and microfabrication technology really advanced the field. What we focus on is these electrode sites where uh, we are beginning to. Uh, trying to more uh, pack more functionality in. And, and for this, we use the nanostructured materials that I described. So let's do a basic neural interface uh, crash course. Uh, these are electrode shanks that are typically inserted into the brain, let's say in the motor cortex for picking up the electrical activity so that you can decode it and maybe transmit it to uh, robotic prosthetics for uh, re rehabilitation. Uh, these are typically a few millimeters long, uh, tens of microns in uh, basically width and uh, the thickness, and you have these thin film electrode sites on them. When the electrode shank is inserted into the tissue, you have uh, there are multiple cell types, but probably the most important ones here are the neurons, which basically create the electrical activity, astrocytes that are supporting cells, and microglia that are the resident macrophage. You insert the electrode and you induce a damage, microglia gets activated, it begins to secrete pro-inflammatory factors, these activate the astrocytes and astrocytes begin to secrete uh, protoglycans and begin to uh, basically encapsulate the electrode over time. So initially the neurons is close, neuron is close to the electrode and what, typically, what we record is the uh, ionic flux modulating the ionic environment uh, that basically modulates the electrical double layer on the electrode, which we pick up with amplifiers as the electrical activity from the neuron. So we want the neuron to be as close to the electrode as possible. However, over time, astrocytes kind of like fibroblasts, if you get a splinter in your finger, trying to encapsulate that uh, splinter, begin to encapsulate the electrode and over time push the neurons away. So this is kind of a histology with the neuro, uh, neural interface tracks that you see into the tissue that astrocytes are encapsulating and neurons are being pushed away. So eventually when this happens, you begin to lose the signal. A basic electrical uh, a circuit schematic of it is that you have the cell and you have certain resistances basically the two of them that i am going to mention here is the seal resistance basically this is the escape of the ions from the neuron into the surrounding environment we want to increase this resistance as much as possible so all that ionic flux just modulates the electrode where we can pick up the signals and there's the electrode impedance we want to minimize this uh, and uh, so basically all those signals can be transmitted to the amplifier without uh, much resistance and we can pick up uh, the signals with high strength. So some neural interface considerations now, if you were to kind of summarize it as we want small electrode footprint, basically those electrode si uh, sites should be small, uh, kind of like a, a pixel size in a digital camera. So you can have high, you can have high spatial resolution. You, have, you want low electrical impedance from those uh, electrodes, as I mentioned, to transmit the signals to the amplifier without resistance. And you want to minimize the adverse tissue response to basically have a robust neuron electron coupling without the astrocytes uh, interfering uh, with, uh, with this uh, junction. So this was actually done it uh, during my postdoc in collaboration with uh, my colleague, Dr. Uh, uh, Eugene Berdzievsky. What we did was we used, typically these electrodes are made of platinum uh, or uh, in some cases por uh, porous uh, or uh, platinum black, that is dendritic platinum. Uh, when you have a flat surface, you can only have a certain electrical impedance to it because electrical impedance uh, basically scales immersely with the capacitance and uh, hence the surface area. So we thought that we can pack more surface area in these electrode sites. And this is a typical multiple electrode array used for recording from neurons for many neuroscience uh, experiments. We replaced the gold and the platinum with the porous electrode. And we used very standard uh, fabrica fabrication techniques. You start with a glass, put on a photoresist, which is a photosensitive polymer. You uh, expose it through uh, with UV light through a mask. And then you uh, successively deposit chrome adhesive layer, gold and gold silver. Uh, insulate the electrodes just to expose the electrode sites and eventually you de-alloy it so you have that nanoporous gold electrode on the sites. If you measure the electrical impedance in artificial cerebrospinal fluid at one kilohertz, which is basically the characteristic frequency that we are most uh, concerned with uh, during uh, electrophysiological recordings, we've seen a reduction in the electrical impedance that was 25 volts. So we were very excited about this, but this excitement is 
a material science excitement uh, that basically does uh, that, that does not yet have a biological basis to it. So we had to uh, see if this has biological relevance. So we tested it in uh, an organotypic brain slice model, basically from a rat hippocampus, where uh, uh, um, it's an important location of the brain, where much of the memory and relaying uh, goes on. You can take slices, which preserves this uh, cellular architecture, which is important for uh, neural uh, function. You can culture these uh, slices over the multiple electrode arrays and uh, you can basically record the spontaneous activity. So here you can see uh, the recording from a standard electrode and these are not really optimized, but uh, you can see a large background noise. When you go to the non scored electrode, you can reduce that background noise. And this reduction is mainly due to the reduction in the electrode impedance. So remember those two resistances that I've talked about. But uh, you also see high signal strength in, on the nanopore gold electrode, which cannot be explained by the reduced electri uh, electrode impedance. So this could be, as some of you may have already guessed, is that probably the neurons are actually sticking better to this uh, electrode and maybe, uh, or preferentially onto this electrode compared to the astrocytes. So that's when I started UC Davis, I got my first student and I thought that this could be a good uh, first hypothesis to test. So what you are seeing here is an astrocyte, one of those cell types that I mentioned that kind of began to attach to the surfaces, uh, basically sticking onto the nanoporous gold surface. Uh, you basically have the cellular processes forming these protein adhesions onto that surface. And uh, as you may also now guess that the topography would influence uh, how a cell attaches to the surface. It's also a very large field of mechanotransduction and mechanobiology that looks into many of these. So our hypothesis was uh, simple. Uh, you basically have these focal adhesion complexes and each cell type, say neurons or astrocytes, may have a different uh, focal adhesion configuration that is either compatible or not so compatible with the underlying topography. So basically the hypothesis is that do neurons and astrocytes differ in their ability to attach to these porous surfaces. So it was a simple experiment. We take the rat cortex, dissociate it. So we have basically the primary cells and seated them on a planar surface and a nanoporous gold surface, uh, cultured them for a couple of weeks, uh, then fixed them and stained them. Uh, so here you can see the neurons in red uh, stained with beta tubulin, astrocytes in green, uh, uh, basically stained for GFAP, glyofibular acid protein, and counter stained for nucleus. And basically, once you have these images, you can process them to uh, for cell counts and cellular spread. So basically, how wide this, how much of, uh, how much the cell is covering the surface. So this is just an image that's kind of covering it. You have the planar surface and the nanopore called surface. We've seen no difference in the neuronal coverage uh, on either surfaces, which is uh, good because we don't want the neuronal attachment to decrease. Uh, but we've seen, uh, uh, surprisingly, astrocytes were less likely to spread on these surfaces. So this is exciting because this is in support of the hypothesis that the topography is reducing the astrocyte spreading. However, we had to play uh, the devil's advocate and be skeptical and ask the question, is this really the topography or is there a metallurgical component? Remember, the way we make nanoporous gold is you leach the silver out. So perhaps there is some residual silver, and silver that is leaching out and astrocytes uh, are sequestering it and it's basically causing the, uh, reducing their viability. So in order to test this, we need to basically uh, somehow rule out the potential of the silver leaching out. We collaborated with uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab with Dr. Monica Beener and used a technique uh, called atomic layer deposition, which is a, basically a purely surface reaction limited uh, process where you can grow conformal thin film ceramics on high aspect ratio structures like this. It's really one of the few techniques you can do this with high aspect ratio structures. So we grew uh, uh, aluminum oxide, alumina, uh, a few nanometers of it uh, across this, uh, along these electrodes, which in, uh, in effect uh, basically sealed the surfaces and switched the ke surface chemistry from gold to alumina, but maintained the same topography. So now we ask the same question. What happens if we culture the astrocytes and neurons, uh, which is a co-culture? We basically uh, are culturing both of them at the same time. Uh, we just pay attention now that microglia is not present because it needs serum, but serum does not 
is not uh, is prohibited for the uh, neuronal survival, which I will talk to later. But what we did here is we cultured the neurons and astrocytes on a variety of different surfaces and basically looked at the coverage for astrocytes and neurons. As you can see for neurons, none of the surfaces had an effect. They were fine attaching uh, on glass, gold, alumina coated gold, nanoporous gold and alumina coated nanoporous gold. But for astrocytes, whether it was coated with alumina or not, for, for the nanopores called, we've seen reduced uh, uh, spreading of the astrocytes, which basically suggests that it is the topography and not the surface chemistry or alumina leaching that has an effect on this. So this is nice because now we have topography to modulate how cells attach onto the surface and preferentially for the neurons. So uh, Eringia would ask, so where, where, how, at what extent of morphology evolution or extent uh, pore size and pores do you need to maximize this effect? So that's what we've studied here. And I'm not going to go into the details of it for the sake of time because I want to cover a few other different topics. But what, uh, basically, we've seen that if you have an unstructured gold, you can see the cells really adherent and spread onto surface. On a porous surface, basically, cells are more loosely attached. So it would be really uh, hard to create a lot of different samples and test these uh, in parallel because uh, you would now, now need multiple uh, animals and there will be some animal to animal variability. So we thought that perhaps there could be a higher throughput uh, method where we can employ microfabrication and test multiple morphologies at once. What we've done for this is we've collaborated again with Lawrence Livermore, with now with Dr. Ribo Matthews, uh, who, who is a laser, uh, he's a photonic scientist. And we microfabricated porous gold patches on a chip and use laser sintering to basically coarsen them to different morphologies. So now on a chip, kind of almost similar to a DNA uh, microarray, except instead of uh, displayed DNAs with different sequences, you actually have uh, materials with different morphologies on a single chip. So now what you can do is you can have these identical chips, uh, so you have repeatability in your experiments, and you can get the cells, culture them on all of, on all of these cheap chips, uh, fix them and stain them, and in high throughput identify what morphologies uh, are more conducive to astrocyte growth. So what we've seen here is that if you have these really fine morphologies, nothing sticks, neither neurons and astrocytes. And this is actually well known from the focal adhesion studies where if you are below a certain uh, focal adhesion uh, radii, uh, you basically cells cannot stabilize themselves. If you go to a little bit larger morphologies, neurons tend to stick better and astrocytes uh, cannot. If you go to much uh, coarser morphologies, it begins to approximate a planar surface and the effective effect is lost. So it's really in the sweet spot of uh, basically 100 nanometer or so where we are seeing this effect. And basically that's what we tune our electrodes to. You can leverage this technique uh, further. And what you can do is you can actually uh, uh, culture cells preferentially on laser centered patterns. So you can create these connected circuits uh, from the neurons uh, that are basically pre-programmed with the laser centering. Um, and we, uh, this was kind of a, just a demonstration of uh, use of these, uh, this scientific finding. All right, so I've talked about the topographical cues and there are other ways of enhancing this interface with the electrodes. And one of them is also drug delivery. So you have these porous films and we can load drug molecules in them and release them to modulate the cellular function even further. So this was, again, one of my uh, first students, uh, Özge Kurtuluş uh, from Turkey. She was in chemical engineering uh, and she's at Intel now. Uh, she, basically, we've again, the, it started with a simple study. You have samples that are with a, a gold or a non-porous gold pattern on it with various thicknesses. We incubate, it, incubate them in fluorescein, uh, basically in the ionized water, which is a good small molecule uh, uh, drug surrogate. And it's easy to quantify because of its fluorescence. Uh, you rinse it and then put the sample in another uh, PCR tube with deionized water and sample the release over time and quantify it with nanodraft with fluorous spectrometry. What you see here is that the release time and the fluorescein release. So as you increase the thickness, you, the loading capacity increases. But what's interesting here is that uh, for a submicron film, these are thin films, uh, from classical diffusion, you would expect that all the fluorescein would be released in milliseconds. However, we are looking at half times on the order of almost a day and longer. 
So what's happening here is that this is actually no longer classical diffusion, but you have these uh, nanotubes where when a molecule is traveling through that nanotube, it's interacting with, uh, it's basically seeing so much surface and as it sees the surface, it absorbs, desorbs, diffuses a little bit, and then sees another surface and absorbs and desorbs. This is hindering the diffusion. So it's really sustaining the release due to the surface uh, adsorption desorption mechanism, which creates a lot, a lot of opportunities for tuning the transport of the molecules that I'll mention in a second. But we've done a study to test this biological relevance. And instead of fluorescein, we loaded with arabinose furnacide, which is an anti-mitotic small molecule with the similar molecular weight as fluorescein. And we loaded the porous films uh, with that and cultured the astrocytes and basically uh, counted the cells on the next, uh, um, uh, on day one and day two for the different concentrations. So zero is vehicle, where uh, it's basically just loaded with uh, PBS and the other ones loaded with the drug molecules. As you can see, as you increase the drug concentration, astrocytes can no longer spread on the surface. If you increase it too much, then it becomes toxic. So this was a, a demonstration that you can load biologically relevant molecules and release them over time. So I, I mentioned that the surface is really important uh, for controlling the release. One thing you could do with the electrode is since it's electrically conductive, you can actually now use electrostatics to control the drug release. Fluorescein, for example, is a fluorescein salt. So when it ionizes, fluorescein is negatively charged. If you pull a positive potential on your electrode, nanoporous gold, with respect to a reference electrode, basically you can electrostatically stabilize the fluorescein on the surfaces. So you can load a lot more fluorescein even on these surfaces. And if you now switch it to a negative charge, you can push the fluorescein molecules out. We've built a basic microfluidic chip to test this. So you have a microfluidic chip where the nanopore skull is attached to the bottom. There's flow and we can measure the fluorescence with a fluor uh, epifluorescent microscope. We create a control scheme where you can read the fluorescence intensity and basically uh, control the, um, the molecular, uh, uh, the, the voltage that you would apply to the electrode to control the release. So you can, for example, prescribe a set point release uh, dose, and you can apply a control voltage to basically control that release. And it tracks really well with the set point. So this now enables us to do electrical control in very small uh, doses and arbitrary time varying doses. So think about, for example, in the case of epilepsy, you may be able to turn on the release or uh, stop it if necessary. So one big problem, obviously, with drug delivery is that eventually you run out of drug molecules. So I had a real talented uh, uh, undergrad in my uh, group, uh, uh, and he we, we just published this paper where we used the basic idea of kind of like a uh, oil lamp Vic uh, analogy, where you have a reservoir and basically the molecules are transported laterally uh, in plane through the film and released from the other side. And this actually works remarkably well. Uh, you can even uh, sustain release in serum, which basically the biofouling does not deter the release rate. And I'm going to mention, uh, talk a little bit more about the mechanisms for this. But with this technique, you can imagine that you can have multiple electrode arrays where in the peripheral uh, electrode pads, you can actually uh, put drug molecule reservoirs and uh, basically route them into the culture through the traces. Uh, and I'm really excited about uh, coupling this with some other techniques that we are looking at at the moment. So if you were to put all of this together on the neural interfaces, well, uh, basically we've shown that we can tune the topography and this uh, basically modulates the cellular attachment. We can do a passive drug release, uh, let's say for reducing uh, the, uh, the adverse tissue response and you can do electrically triggered uh, on demand release. So we are now looking into combining these in collaboration with Professor Karen Moxon and uh, the testing them in vivo to see if some of these uh, interesting phenomena we've observed in vitro also uh, extend into the in vivo models. So let's uh, change gears a little bit and now talk a little bit about the electrochemical uh, detection. So I covered the neural interfaces with the, uh, this really needs no motivation at the moment because I mean, we are all aware that we need techniques to be able to detect biomarkers, whether it's for pathogens or diseases or for any type of surveillance for humans, plants and foods with high fidelity uh, and uh, speed. And there are different biomarkers. It could be DNA, RNA, and protein. I mean, the central dogma of biology. 
Nucleic acids are uh, especially nice because they have the sequence information uh, and you can get more uh, specificity from that. RNA is even better because it's basically self-amplified in the tissue. So you can, instead of having to do PCR or other techniques, you can, uh, if you, you may have enough RNA uh, to detect, uh, uh, detect it as a biomarker. So there are a variety of different techniques, optical uh, and uh, other means. Uh, we've focused on electrochemical detection because it's easy to uh, uh, interface with electronics and it's a little bit more conducive for um, basically portable, uh, portable applications. With the electrochemical sensors, it's basically the electrode plays a huge role. And this is electrochemistry is basically an old discipline. Uh, you uh, initially, these were gold, glass carbon or carbon paste electrodes. But with the advent of microfabrication, you could pattern these electrodes. And this basically now provides us with the ability to multiplex uh, the assays. You can have multiple probe molecules and uh, capture the tar multiple targets. and. Uh, but recently, with the nanostructured electrodes, we begin to have even uh, more uh, features in electrochemical detection, such as improved uh, uh, limit of detection, uh, tuning the ranges, and some other techniques. And in all of these, basically, the nanostructure morphology has a big influence on both the electrochemistry and also the probe target binding. So let me give you a quick crash course into how the nucleic acid sensing works in our uh, case. You have a planar electrode, you have your uh, probe uh, DNA uh, for capture, kind of like think about again a DNA microarray. You backfill with mercaptic exonol to passivate the back surfaces uh, effect and also to orient the probes up so they are mo more accessible. Now you can introduce methylene blue, which is a redox molecule that associates uh, with the bases. Now, if you use an electrochemical uh, protocol uh, and reduce, we use square wave voltometry and reduce the methylene blue, which basically you give it an electron, you get a probe signal. This green signal is basically tells us that we have the probe molecules and the methylene blue associated with them. Now, if you introduce your target DNA and if there is a match, it hybridizes with the probe. And now due to the steric effects, you have less room for the methylene blue to attach. And if you were to repeat the uh, electrochemical protocol, you get your target signal, which is reduced because there's less methylene blue. And this reduction, which we term percent signal suppression, is basically uh, indicative of successful hybridization, and it's also quantitative for the amount of DNA that you've captured. There have been a lot of studies on electrochemical sensors, and what we were interested in is uh, how does nanostructure influence this behavior? Because there's this general attitude that is, when in doubt, go with nanostructured materials, but nobody really looked into, or not many people looked into why uh, the nanostructure influences this. So we thought that this could be a good scientific question to go after. Again, we used our techniques for creating different morphologies, and tested this electrochemical detection for these different micro, micro uh, uh, nano uh, structure and morphologies. So one thing that is uh, really a kind of a um, notion in the electrochemical detection field is that effective surface area is the reason why the sensor uh, basically uh, the nanostructure materials improve limit of detection. However, our studies show that this is basically the concentration of the target molecule that you uh, um, introduce, and this is the signal suppression, basically detection. Higher signal suppression means basically you are detecting, and you can kind of see as we reduce the concentration of the target, the signal uh, decays. But for different electrodes, we determine the surface area through anodic stripping uh, electrochemical uh, method, and EF basically is the enhancement factor. So for gold, it's basically control just one surface area. It's basically the electrochemical surface area to the geometric surface area, right? It's the same for gold, there is no pores. If you go to the porous unannealed gold, it's nine times more surface area. If you go to this annealed, basically sintered nanoporous gold, you have uh, uh, the reduced surface area compared to the initial porous electrode. So what, what this is interesting because we got the highest or the, the best limit of detection with actually not really the highest uh, surface area. So while surface area plays a role, it's not really the only factor that plays into the limit of detection. So we thought that uh, what, what we wondered what the case for uh, what the reason for this could be. We looked into this simple hypothesis that if you have a planar surface, just to compare the limit of detection difference between a planar surface and a porous surface, if a DNA target 
going through random Brownian motion uh, approaches a surface and does not hybridize, it's lost into the bulk again. But if you have a porous surface, and if the uh, target goes into that porous structure, it's surrounded with so much probe capture molecules that it has a higher probability of being uh, captured and hybridized, hence to produce a signal. So we think that it's actually a transport mediated and also the probability of captured mediated mechanism for this. And it's similar for why this uh, cracked morphology improves the limit of detection even more. Now, if you think about the, uh, the thin film, for an uncracked morphology, the target molecules, the DNA can only permeate from the top. But if you have this cracked morphology, you have these isolated porous islands where you can have transport and permeation from the sides as well, which increases the uh, probability of capture further. Um, so we think that this is really a morphology-driven mechanism. Um, so one, one question you might ask, like, how, uh, what is the influence of the thickness? So you, have, you may have a really thin nanoporous gold or a thick nanoporous gold, and we wanted to study this to see if there is an optimal uh, uh, morphology for this. Because you can think of it as, if, if, if it's too thin, then it's kind of like planar gold, so the effect is lost. But if it's too thick, then you have some undesirable effects. The target needs to permeate all the way through the pores to actually capture anything. And when you have a large pore structure, you have high capacitive currents, which is background noise in essence. And that basically buries your signal, uh, the Faradix signal uh, in that uh, capacitive signal. So we created these different uh, thicknesses and now use the MB tag probe morphology and did real-time hybridization studies and seeing that as you increase the surface enhancement factor, which is basically a surrogate for the thickness, eventually you reach a point that you uh, max out uh, in your limit of detection, uh, which is the highest current you get here, and eventually it begins to drop and plateaus. And that's where basically, as we predicted, where the capacitive current and permeation of the nucleic acids uh, become an issue. So we, we think uh, that we've basically shown that you can tune the morphology for uh, and the thickness for uh, optimizing the limit of detection in this case, and also to tune the range of detection with the morphology. This is all nice, but once you try to detect uh, nucleic acids in a complex biological media, let's say liquid biopsy, then you begin to have uh, many other issues because now we have a lot of different proteins, let's say uh, blood uh, and cellular debris that's going to follow the surface and now you won't be really, and it's going to block the charge transfer. So let's look at the case here. You have, you have a planar gold electrode that you are trying to detect DNA with. If it's in phosphate buffer, it works perfectly. You have very high signal. But if you put it in fetal bone serum, the surface is fouled with the basically serum molecules, uh, albumin mainly probably, and it blocks the charge transfer and you cannot detect anything. The signal is really low. Nanoporous code surprisingly really prevents this. And there have been a few other groups that looked into this in the context of electrochemical uh, uh, performance. What happens is that even in phosphate buffer or in uh, uh, serum, the, the effect is really not lost. You can still detect with high fidelity. And the reason for this is that the nanoporous code act as an intrinsic sieve where the large molecules are excluded. But since the pores are irregular, they are not uh, completely occluded by these proteins. So it's small molecules like methylene blue or fibrillary nucleic acids can still permeate into these pristine, deeper surfaces where you can have electrochemical detection. We tested the hypothesis by coarsening them, uh, the electrodes, and you can see the effect is be begin to uh, get lost because now proteins can permeate deeper and fall the deeper surfaces as well. So now you can see that we want coarser pores for better transport, hence limit of detection, but we have finer pores to enhance the biofolding resilience. So these are basically, it's a typical engineering trade-off problem. Again, we have the same issue. How do we find those morphologies? You can test a lot of different electrodes, uh, but it would be very time consuming and you would have repeatability issues. So we thought that we can again use this high throughput method where we have a multiple electrode array, but this time we use electrochemical cycling, where you have your electrode uh, in sulfuric acid and you just cycle it with cyclic voltammetry in sulfuric acid, which again enhances the surface diffusion of gold atoms and leads to coarsening, but it's very controllable because you can just uh, adjust it with the number of cycles that you are going through. And you can basically have multiple electrodes array on one chip with different morphologies. 
Using this, you can identify which one basically breaks even uh, the limit of detection and all the, the biofouling resilience. So that's precisely what we've done. We've basically tested these chips and identified a region of like 25 to like say 30 nanometer pore sizes, uh, medium pore sizes that maximizes the biofouling resilience and the limit of detection. I'll end this with one more uh, thing that we've done. Now, let's say we are kind of looking at it. We have the pore electrode with the capture probes. This is just a schematic of the cross section of a pore. Uh, you, uh, we introduced the target molecules in a biofouling conditions, proteins attached to the surface, but we still can capture them. What you can do now is you can wash off the proteins and basically SDS or some detergent, and you can electrochemically reduce the thiol gold bond. So now you have the hybrids basically free in the pore structure. Just like the drug delivery, you can pull a negative potential and push those nucleic acids out. Now you are basically doing a, a sequence specific detection and purification. And this works remarkably well. You can, for example, here we have the gels from um, a case where you have many different DNA fragments in a serum. So you see a lot of different bands. But after you run this cycle, you can actually capture the 26 mer that was originally intended. And we've uh, published a couple of years ago where we can uh, detect and purify RNA from whole blood without having to extract it and then do molecular conductance to uh, basically uh, get information about the sequence, uh, po like basically polymorphisms uh, in the RNA structure. All right, so now we are basically in the status of uh, applying these techniques to uh, uh, to multiplex detection in the context of plant sample processing and also blood sample processing. There's uh, uh, agriculture is huge in UC Davis, and also we have a very good veterinary medicine uh, and uh, the medical school. So we are collaborating with the people there for some of these studies. All right, so what's next? In the last bit, I'll just mention these. We've developed these uh, uh, electrochemical detection methods neural interfaces. Now, for the last few years, we've been kind of extending into a new area of applying these technologies for tissue chips to study uh, certain physiological phenomena. Um, I'll just give one example here first. Uh, we've, the first thing we've kind of looked into uh, was a different electrode um, configuration. Remember, at the very beginning, I talked about planar electrodes get, that, that gets implanted into the brain and the electrode sites are on the surface. Here we are using a technique where the electrodes are encapsulated in the microchannels. And this basically increases that seal resistance that I mentioned at the beginning. All the ions that are basically fluxed out of the axons are now contained in the channel. So you can collect them much more efficiently and you get very high signal to noise ratio. And basically, in this case, you have the neurons and the axons just grow spontaneously into these uh, microchannels. And this is kind of a different uh, configuration for neurons, uh, neural interfaces that we are looking into. Now, we, if we extend this into uh, a more complicated uh, microfluidic system, uh, the, what we are interested in, uh, interested here is to study how inflammation propagates in tissue. This is a really intriguing phenomena where uh, let's say if somebody has a spinal cord injury, you have inflammation in the brain that is far away from the origin of the injury, but very localized. So this cannot be explained by diffusion. It's too long of a distance, not through just circulation because it's too localized. So we have the hypothesis that this may be due to axonal, uh, basically through axonal transport and electrophysiology that we are uh, communicating and propagating neuroinflammation locally to distal regions. It's hard to study this in vivo. There are way too many factors uh, going on. So we basically uh, built these multiple electrode arrays uh, and encapsulated in microfluidic chambers and chips. We basically have microchannels separating the uh, two chambers. You can have two neural populations on each one of them and uh, you can change the fluid level. So there is convective flow from the target to the source. So whatever biochemical soluble factor occurs here cannot go to the target chamber but you have the axons connecting the two populations. So in essence, you have electrically connected structures, but chemically separated uh, populations. So now you can injure one and you can basically see if the neuroinflammation occurs uh, in the other region. And we are having some promising results in this one. But in order to do this, we had to develop a new in vitro model of neuroinflammation. 
In the first studies that I mentioned, we were just doing the astrocytes and neurons, co-cultures, uh, and uh, because microglia do not survive, they need serum. But if you put in serum, then the astrocytes and neurons do not survive. So we developed this strike culture based on basically uh, another study that looked into solo microglia culture. And we create this strike culture media that basically now can preserve both neurons, astrocytes, and microglia. And IL-34 basically is a, a trigger for the microglia to keep it uh, viable. TGF-beta is an anti-inflammatory that keeps it in a quiescent state and cholesterol basically stabilizes the homeostatic uh, aesthetics of the microglia. We, I'm very excited about this model because we can capture not only neurotoxic behavior like LPS uh, injury. For example, if you hit it with LPS, LPS triggers microglia through tollback receptors. They put out a ton of pro-inflammatory factors, which is toxic to the neurons. As you can see, the red is completely gone, the neurons. You can capture me uh, mechanical trauma like the electrode insertion, but you can also capture neuroprotective behavior. For example, in an epileptic seizure where you have excitotoxicity, you would, uh, the microglia plays a crucial role in increasing the survival uh, and protection of the neurons. So we are collaborating with uh, a few, uh, quite a few groups now in testing this platform in different, uh, this model in different techniques. And let me know if you have any interest in trying it out as well. Um, what we've uh, shown that we can uh, culture, uh, maintain the triculture in this microchannel environment, so we can have axonal connections that co connect the two populations. And we've shown that you can uh, maintain electrophysiological connectivity between, between them as well. So if you have your primary channel and also the secondary channel, if you hit the primary channel with glutamate, which is an excite, uh, basically an excitatory neuromodulator, uh, I mean neurotransmitter, uh, it uh, excites the neurons. And as you can see through calcium activity uh, increases in the primary, it also matches with the secondary. And these are chemically separated. We've done fluorescein controls. So the connection is through the axons. And uh, stay tuned, hopefully we'll be uh, showing some of these results soon. So these are some of the research topics uh, that we that are going on in my lab. In the last just two minutes, I'll take a couple of minutes to uh, make a few remarks on interdisciplinary education and training. I mean, these, as you may appreciate, we are beginning to be even more into scenario as we go and team science is important. So how do we train uh, students uh, and uh, basically the, 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 the postdocs and everybody on these type of topics? And uh, when I started and I'm the grad program chair, as I mentioned, I'm really interested in education in general. So when I first started, I developed a course, which is uh, basically micro and technology and life sciences. And it's a course on everything I know in a nutshell, which basically starts with microfab, goes into surface science, and then discusses biology and combines all of them in the context of writing a proposal that brings these ideas together. Now we are looking into, uh, in the spring, I'm leading and uh, offering a course in neuroengineering, which will be a team taught course from uh, faculty from different disciplines and also uh, a school of medicine. So we are interested in uh, basically starting the neuroengineering initiative uh, in UC Davis. And I think a lot of these could be shared across institutions. So if you have any interest in these, please let me know. I'd be happy to collaborate on them. And finally, we, are, we have some uh, uh, projects, mainly master students projects in creating these video games for training students on different these different techniques. For example, one of them was uh, we create a video game that captures the clean room so we can teach microfabrication over games. And I'm interested in developing it for biological uh, techniques as well, like cell culture or uh, uh, immunostaining or ELISA. So, I mean, if you have any interest in these, uh, I'd be happy to collaborate as well. Um, with that, I mean, this was all the students and the postdoc that did all the work. Obviously, I have uh, very talented students, luckily, and uh, and it's been really a pleasure seeing students grow and graduate and go to bigger and better things. Uh, mo most of the neural interface work was done by uh, Chris Chapman, my, one of my few students. The drug delivery was done with uh, by Özge and uh, uh, Zidong, um, and electrochemical detection was Pallavi, uh, uh, Joanna uh, as well. And neuroinflammation work is mainly Noah uh, and uh, gut brain access is Greg and Hayan. And so he's a new student who is working on the, um, the, the material science applications. Uh, I have great collaborators here, uh, thankful for that. And I would like to acknowledge our funding uh, sources that make, make this possible. So with that, I hope I was able to interest you in some of the work that's going on in my lab. 
and I'd be happy to take uh, questions. Thank you.